Hello everybody, it's James here with WSI and what can you say about my next guest? He's a former NWA heavyweight champion, he's an ECW original. Uh, I've got that one right. He's a wrestling yes, legend and he's a legend with the ladies as well. It is Wildfire Tommy Richard. Somebody say something about Fired Up. Somebody say something about James. Let me tell you how you do this. I want to welcome everybody to WSI, Manchester, England with my man James, baby. And it's a pleasure to be there. Never had an opportunity to wrestle in England, but the, uh, the old 17 went there. I used to get fan mail from there. I tell you what, I, that's a place I'd love to have come. I can't believe that. Anything... I hope for you didn't buy me over, but. <clears throat> oh, you know, with the pandemic well, and everything. Well, that was a quick no, wasn't it? <laughs> I don't host the shows, man. I mean, if I had a spare bedroom and a plane flight ticket, you would be over here so fast. I'd, I'd just be interviewing you for three days. I don't I host any wrestling. Couch. I sleep on the couch. Oh, my, my couch Moses is less than six foot. sleeping in his garage. <laughs> 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 Nothing but the best five-star accommodation then, is oh, it? Oh, yeah, they lined me up now, let me tell you. But how are you doing today, man? I'm doing good. I'm, you know, I'm fresh as a daisy. It's a Sunday, it's I, a Sunday I, afternoon. I, what, how, how cold is it in Manchester? Um, it's not quite cold enough to snow, but it's it's miserable enough to rain every single right. day for two months straight. So it's sort of like... I know. I left, I left Myrtle Beach to come to West Virginia. I left on Friday, and it was 83 degrees when I left there. Come here to... West Virginia had to put two coats on. <laughs> you know, it's cold. Well, we've had two storms. It's blown down my fret fence. It's always like two or three de degrees above freezing. So you don't even get yeah. the interesting snow. All you have to do is get the powerful winds, the miserable rain, you, you know, and just try not to kill yourself for hey, a couple Dad, of months until you the quit, sun. Can you quit bribing a minute and let me say, <laughs> hey, because if it wasn't for all the wrestling fans, you wouldn't have that show I wouldn't be a wrestler. Thank all the hey, I always thank all the fans, but I want to give a special thank to all the wrestling fans there in Manchester. Hey, this guy's got one heck of a show. Everybody tune in. I mean, it don't get any better than Tommy Wildfire Rich. Somebody say something about fired up. You can't ask for a better plug than that, can you? Huh? <laughs> you can't ask for a better plug than that, can you? Oh, no, sir. Right, so I the first question I'm going to ask you is, is you're 65 now, aren't you? Yes. How is, after so many decades of being on the road, doing wrestling full-time all those years, how's the body holding up? Shoot, I'm like a dead good 50-year-old man. <laughs> I'm probably about your age, ain't I? I'm, uh, I'm not quite 50 yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just teasing with you. <laughs> no, it, you know, I've, I've had to have two hip replacements, uh, and I was in bad shape. But now that I got them done, I, you know, I, I, you know, I can't do what I did 50 years ago because I was 200 pounds. Now I'm close to 280. You know, so, uh, but when you're on the road all the time, you know, you had to die, you had to do this, blah blah blah, and. Uh, I'm drawing Social Security, so I figure I figure if I'm old enough to draw Social Security, I can eat a little bit too. Hmm. But uh, you know, it, it's good though. But I still love it, man. Like coming to West Virginia, uh, we come down yesterday. We wrestled in uh, Hart, West Virginia. They had about six, seven hundred people. Uh, then, uh, well, Friday we did some. I went and did a wrestling seminar in some. There's so many little towns here in West Virginia, it's hard to remember. And then today I'm over here at Moose's Wrestling School. Uh, he does a TV here. We're doing, doing a wrestling show, a TV show. And I'm in an eight-man tag today. And then we've got to do uh, – got to sign him some autographs. Mm. With, uh, and you're doing this as well. But uh, I've got to ask this. Do you have the sort of thing that Honky Tonk Man does where he when he was sort of advancing – in age, he told the uh, told the guy he was wrestling, "You've got one bump out of me. Make it count." Is it the same thing for you? You, you make the bumps count now. Wayne Ferris did that even when he was young. <laughs> <laughs> I love Wayne. I love, he was in Tennessee when I was there. Yeah, but he done that back man, when he started. Nah, I like Wayne well. Uh, you know, it's just according to who you wrestling. You out there with somebody that can wrestle. You want to? I still like to put a show on, mm. you know. But but 
you go to some of these shows and uh, they don't know a top uh, top wrist lock from a wrist watch, then you don't want to do too much with them. Mm. You know, I mean, I'm 65 and I still, I still go out to entertain. I still love doing it. I still love signing the autographs. You know, it's, uh, yeah, I've been very blessed. I mean, you figure I started 19. I graduated from high school in 74, started wrestling about midway through 75, uh, and still do it every, every now and then. Now, now, what we used to do years ago, seven days a week and wrestle 10 times in a week, I couldn't do that. I could do the weekend and wrestle. It takes me two or three days to get over that now. <laughs> but, you know, it's uh, – it's a different world, but but I don't even think a lot of these young kids, they, they don't have a clue what we used to do. I mean, you'd ride 200 miles, get in the car, get out, go in a building, sign autographs, whatever, get in the ring and wrestle, get back in the car, drive another 200 miles back home, uh, get up the next day, go to the gym. Two o'clock, you're rolling out to go somewhere else, you know. These guys, they just fly everywhere, you know, and they don't work seven days a week, ten times. You know, it's – it's uh, it's it's but that's the old school and the new school, mm. you know. Uh, I, I hate it for these young kids that really want to be wrestlers because it's hard for them. But like when it was territories, say me, if I was just starting where I started in Tennessee, I wrestled there and I got a little better, a little better. And so they sent me to Georgia, and they told him the kid, kid's just starting, but he's improving, you know. And I got, but I got to Georgia, and I was lucky. I, you know, all the black folk and white folk loved him, so Tommy Ridge, because I was just a little skinny cornbread boy out there with them big, big men. I mean, I was actually a kid in the man's game. Back then, you didn't get in the wrestling business till you was thirty, probably, and uh, and I was eighteen when I started. You know, so I was actually, I really was a kid in a man's game. Well, how did you actually uh, come to the attention of, I believe, was it Nick Goulas at the time? How did you come to uh, Jerry Jarrett and Nick Goulas's attention and how did you break into wrestling? Oh, Nick Goulas didn't have nothing to do with it. He, uh, uh, you ever, you, did you get the magazines Bill After had Pro Illustrated? Uh, they were a bit before my time. I know we got some magazines, but I'm not sure. you seen some, I'm sure. Yeah, I know the pro wrestling you illustrated. The front cover yeah, where yeah, yeah. They have the, you seen the front cover where they had the apartment wrestling? Yes, I have. Yeah, that's where I started. They let me wrestle them gals. Oh, okay. I just teased it. Look at the wrist. I was too serious. You had the you had the you had the hook in then. I was I was completely believing yeah. you. Oh, that boost, man! I've had him going all weekend. No, but. Uh, <laughs> No, actually, uh, I lived in Hendersonville. Eddie Marlin and, and my daddy was good friends. And uh, so they went down one day to the – they both decided they wanted to wrestle, so they went down. They went down to the, you know, the gym and uh, signed up to train. Well, anyway, uh, my daddy went one time. He didn't go back. He got that ass whooped. He didn't like getting that ass whooped, I don't reckon. Uh, so he didn't go back. You know, he didn't go back. But Eddie Marlin did. And we were friends. I, I used to go to matches with Eddie. I'd go to Evansville, Indiana from Nashville, you know, because I loved wrestling. And so I just grew up around it. And then uh, Jerry Jarrett married Eddie Marlin's daughter. So Eddie – Jerry lived up there in Henderson, Hendersonville, and that's where I lived too. Well, I was, I was a decent football player. So, you know, his, he was divorced from his first wife, and she had the kids and wasn't of them very athletic at the time. So he'd come on Friday night. He'd take off from going to wrestling and come watch me play football. And uh, so it just one thing led to another. They took me deep sea fishing with them. I went with and, you know, I, back then I was like 16, but I, we went to uh, Destin, Florida. It was Tojo Yamamoto, Jerry the King Lawler, Sam Bass, Tojo, Jerry Jarrett, and Eddie Marley. You know, that's, that's a class of characters there. And uh, 
So, you know, and I didn't want to get seasick. My mama got me some drowning me. So anyway, we go out, but we're going out. We go so far out, it's one of the deals where you got to spend the night out, you know, because we're going way out there. Well, they bought beer and food and everything. We get out. It gets stormy so bad, we couldn't even come back in. The deck boy got up the next morning. He'd slept outside on something. The anchor broke loose, busted his face. And so we just went back, man, and it was slosh. I, I ain't never one of them driving me. Sam Bass, I don't know if you know who he was. He was a manager. I mean, he, he was old when I started wrestling. But he got on his hands and knees and crawled to the back of the boat. He was throwing up. It was awful. I had a good time just getting to meet them guys. But it was sure, <laughs> yeah, it was bad. <laughs> I've got to ask you, with Nick Goulas, because I've mentioned his name specifically, was he the cheapest man in wrestling at the time? Well... I said, I never really, like, when I first started, I, Jerry Jerry broke me in. And, you know, they were they were like partners, kind of, because Jerry ran one end of Tennessee and Nick run the other end. So they would switch talent and stuff. Uh, but Nick, Nick, he'd tell you, he'd say, hey, boy, he said, I'm going to have you fart through silk for a while. I ain't never farted through the first piece of silk, if that's what you ask. <laughs> then I seen some of the guys, bless their heart, they drive in in a new Cadillac and leave on the Greyhound. So he probably wasn't the best payoff. <laughs> <laughs> but he drove good houses, you know. And I didn't understand why guys, the reason I went there, because I wanted to go there and learn, you know, do, I went there and did a couple of angles and stuff. So when they took me to Memphis, I'd be really ready to roll, you know. Hmm. So it, it all worked out good. Hey, Moose, you think about put a couple of them in the freezer? Anyway, Moose, he ain't very good, uh, whatever you call it. But I tell you what, he's he, he's he's a nice fella. With <laughs> yeah, he, at least he pays. <laughs> of course, of course. He got me a room for two days, and I ain't been there four hours yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, I, I should but say that Moose is the come, promoter at the moment that you're staying with. Yes, yeah. Well, we'll come over. He's got his wrestling school here, and his, he's got a big gym in his yard. So he does TV tapings out there. He's got a real good setup. Hmm. Even though I don't like him that much, he, he's really <laughs> good to the boys. Maybe not me, but the rest of them, he's really nice too. <laughs> Got a hell of a building for him to work out in. Plus, he does a TV show in there. So he's got it's a, it's a real good setup. Uh, going back to uh, the uh, 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 Nashville, excuse me. Did you ever get the pleasure of wrestling George Goulas? No, but you, you ever heard of Shane Douglas? I have heard him of Shane Douglas. George Goulas was tag team champions. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you the truth. No, he wasn't. But I was a six man tag team champion with him. Yeah, that was embarrassing. <laughs> oh, look, speaking of that, hey, Hello. Shane. Hi, Shane. Good seeing you, brother. I gotta get going. Good seeing you, brother. Love you. Okay. Hey, have a good one. He's a good guy. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I'll see you next time. Time. Have a good trip back. <laughs> wow, that's my first run in ever as well on this show. So that's a pretty, uh, that's a pretty good one. Oh, yeah, you never know what you're going to get with Moose. You might have me book next time. He'll be out here with a blonde-haired wig on. You know, he's, uh, he's quite the character. I spoke to Adrian Street recently as well, so if anyone knows about blonde wigs. Is that right? Adrian Street. I wrestled in Continental Championship Wrestling, and when I was in Memphis, I had to, I had the pleasure of meeting him. What a great person he is, too. Well, you, you know, I... I yeah, please carry on. Do you know what? We'll bounce oh, well, all about the place. But I Adrian Street. There. I, I think I might wrestle Adrian once or twice because uh, we was in Continental. Me and my cousin Johnny Rich was teamed up. And, of course, Adrian, he was a singles guy. And uh, But, yeah, Adrian, he was a very nice person. Mm. When you first saw that character, did it actually take you aback with all the dress and everything like that? Because surely nobody would have seen anything even remotely like that since the days of Gorgeous George. Well, like some of them guys in Golden Ring, they might not have been dressed like Adrian, but they's a lollipop, a couple of them. Mm. <laughs> no, so you say, no. But Adrian, he was a class act. I mean, uh, you know, 
and that stuff, and they knew how to do it. And he was doing it after it had already been done, so it's harder to get heat with it, but he got it, mm. you know. But 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 the, and we were talking about that yesterday too on one of these things. Uh, a lot of the problem with our business today is that everybody wants to be an in betweener. They don't want to really be a baby face because they got to be nice, and they don't want to be a heel because they can't sell pitch. Or they can, and that's what they do, and that's why I call them an in betweener. Mm. Back in the day, if one of them heels went back when I when I started, if a heel went out and had him a pitcher table set up, <laughs> they'd have called the police and had him arrested. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You just, I mean, you know, it, the world is, is is it's always been since the beginning of time good versus evil. You know. So you got to have a good guy and you got to have a bad guy. You got to have somebody people can hate and you got to have somebody that people can love. You know, I mean, there might be one or two, but in between, but everybody can't be in between, mm. you know, and they, they all want to wear blue jeans to crap now. That nobody, Marquis says wrestling. And some of them that don't know how to wrestle, they ought to at least buy some wrestling gear. That way at least they can say, well, I got the gear. You know, I hope I learned how to rest. But it's just, it, it, it's it's got so bad used to back in the day. Uh, a lot of these kids, if they'd want some of them funk wrestling school or Eddie Graham or uh, Les Thornton, Les that Les, Les Thornton. Uh, you know, Les Thornton's Les Thornton. the English guy, isn't he? Les Thatcher. English, was yeah, more, yeah. English, he was the champion. Yeah. Yeah. I think he might have had a school up there. And this has been years ago. I don't even know where I got – I hadn't even thought of his name because I ain't seen him in for never. But uh, he he would take – you know, you didn't – like, used to – and now, I mean, they call it sports entertainment. You know, you, I mean, you like magic? I've seen magic shows, yes. You've seen magic. Okay, yeah. magic. I love to go watch it. But once I figure out how that trick's done, then I don't give, you know, I don't care about watching. Mm. So, so our mentality was back in the day, you kayfabe, you never seen no good guys ride with bad guys. And if you went somewhere, if you went, it was fine to go to the bar. But if you went in that bar and you're told when you come into the territory, you can go to any bar you want to. Somebody starts some shit with you. You fight them. If you lose, you might as well keep going, mm. you know. But but it, but you used to tell I me, mean, somebody told me my business was fake. And I'm going to tell you something. Too, go in there and go on our Broadway and tell me how fake that is. You know, I mean, you guys back then, you, have, you had to wrestle every day because we didn't get – we wasn't on contract. So you didn't want to go out there and kill the guy because you might have to wrestle him tomorrow night or your friend might, whatever. And so if somebody didn't show up, they didn't get paid, and you didn't get paid. Uh, so so just it was hard. Said, but sorry to interrupt, but just uh, just going back on something you said before is who would go into a bar and intentionally start fights just to prove how tough they were or who loved no, it? No, 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 not to. No, I ain't talking about the wrestlers. I'm talking about we go in, and you know they come always a couple of smart asses sitting over here drinking and think they twenty foot tall or whatever. And uh, and it was funny because I was a little this one, and I'd always think, and they'd always come over and mess with the big guys. I'd think well, if I was gonna pick somebody, it'd be the little blonde haired fella. <laughs> it wouldn't be it wouldn't be Hacksaw Jim Duggan. I, I'll give you a story. I was with Hacksaw Jim Duggan one night. I had went in for the weekend for once. So anyway, we was out uh, wherever Gillies is. We'd been right, we'd wrestled somewhere. We was going through the town. We seen Gillies. And it, of course, it was back when it was hot. I mean, it was so slap out. So Doug said, you want, you want to get a beer? I said, yeah, because you know, back then, that was my cup of tea. And so anyway, so we stop and go on. He said, and it was, I mean, if you got five foot apart, you couldn't find each other. That's how full it was. And so anyway, he said, you got to get your, your head to the restroom for, you know. So anyway, we're going to the restroom, right? Well, there's a little stall. I walk in that little stall, and then they got a little tree. And Doug had looked over at me. He said, 
watch this. He said, before we get out of here, I'll have to knock some, or so, no, somebody's going to want to fight me and I'll have to knock them out. I thought, Jim, I don't hardly see that coming. I said, because I'm going to, if I'm one of the rednecks, I'm going to pick me and hope you stay out of it. Sure enough, we're standing there. Boy, old boy walked in the walked in that bathroom, looked up at Jim Duggan, and he was, you know, he had to look up at him. He said, Ooh, you sure are a big ugly motherfucker. <laughs> Duggan said, looked at me, he said, what I tell you. He said, and Duggan looked at him, he said, What'd you say? He said, You sure are a big ugly before he got that last word out, Duggan hit him. Knocked him out. He was laying in that floor in the pee and whatever else was in there. He was, Doug and said, well, I guess we better get out of here. So we both stepped over him and we got in the car and never got a beer. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's them stories that are good. If you had to walk into a bar with like the roughest, toughest bar with any three wrestlers that you, of your era to look after you, who would be the three that were just the toughest guys? Uh, sh- there wasn't many of them back then that wasn't tough. <laughs> I would, I'll put it this way: I wouldn't want to been on on like been on the other side of the bar and had to fight any of them. To be honest, you know, because they they would get in the ring. Well, you know, back then it was a work, it was a work, but they wanted people to believe, and and they that's they get they jolly beating each other up. Who could take the hardest or whatever? You know, they were tough men. You, uh, you ever heard of Danny Hodge? That's one of the questions I was going to ask you about was Danny Hodge as well. Please, yeah. He, he, you know, he was a boxer. Well, when I first started, when I first started wrestling, I started in Tennessee. And I was, uh, Friday, we'd come into Memphis and we'd stay at the Admiral Benbow. And, you know, and, and that's the reason I was so blessed. I was an 18-year-old kid, like I said, in the man's game. And, but they all treated me. I'd go, you know, instead of having to sit in my room and stuff, I'd go hang out with them, you know. And and I just thought that was so cool. And Danny Hodge, you know, you know how you see him bust him apples? You know how you see him do that? Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of people, they'd take razor blades and cut them where they would bust. But Danny Hodge, he had that double t- – he could for real take and squeeze that apple and bust it. They told me, uh, he told me one time he was out in Amarillo, Texas, and them roads go, they're flat, go for miles, miles, and miles. Anyway, he run off a bridge. He fell asleep, run off a bridge. His car flipped, and it had water in it, and he was in the car. He had to kick his windshield out, and his neck, but he had a broke neck. His neck was broke. I'll tell you how much of a man he is. I've had to lay there drown probably. But he took, kicked the windshield out, held his neck, crawled, crawled, got to the bank, had to crawl up the bank, and they found him laying on the side of the road. He was still holding his neck and still wrestled after all of that. Yeah, he's an amazing man. I mean, I've heard he used to bust pliers in half just with his bare hands, that kind of thing. Uh, with, see, with that's, that's art that's gone. Mm. You know, it's it's uh see it like old school and new school. Old school, we were all our own characters. You know what I'm saying? Ox Baker, Ox Baker. You could you can Vince ain't gonna find nobody in the world to look like Ox Baker. You know, he was that was Ox Baker was Ox Baker, and uh, looked like a Neanderthal. And of course, when I started, he was older. And his knees was bad. He couldn't move good. But you, they'd show that face on TV, and uh, he'd cut that promo, and it'd be sold out that night. Mm. And, like, I wrestled him quite a bit after he got older. And, of course, I was quick, so we would do – I would work around him, and he'd do his stuff. But then people still believed in him, you know. Mm. With Ox Baker, now, uh, he didn't he have the sort of bad-slash-good fortune of have two people that he worked with die practically immediately after? I, I I know one, and it may have been two. I'm not positive. You know about that, not that. 
Yeah, uh, well, I'll, I'll move back off Fox Baker and just mention one thing about Danny Hodges. I hear that Danny Hodges, one of those guys that not only the uh, drunks in bars and stuff would go and start a fight with, but other wrestlers would try and test themselves against Danny Hodge and thought nothing of him because he was 210 pounds, let's say. Yeah, oh, yeah. But he was 210 pounds all man. You know, he's – well, and plus, he, you know, he had, he had been a professional boxer before he started wrestling. So he was pretty doggone tough. With um, – I'm going to move on now. So we'll go to Georgia a bit. And uh, I was going to ask you, what prompted your move to Georgia? Was it just – you were going to get a, a better place on the card or more money or, or what was it? Well, it's, you know, like I said, Jerry, Jerry, he was a promoter there in Tennessee. He's the one that brought me into business. Uh, and we just had, I had no big problem because I still talk to Jerry, but it, just this little thing happened. And uh, I asked him, I said, and like, I, like my first thing was I did with Nick after we do TV We'd go eat, and there'd be TV up, and you could see Channel 17 wrestling. You know, and I always – I'd look at it, especially when you wrestle with Nick's boys. I'd look at that TV, and I'd think, boy, if I could ever get there, I'd, I'd be made the big time. You know, but it, I was already in the big time, you know, because I, I you know, 18, and it was wrestling. But, I, but, that, was, but that was the grand stage because of cable, you know. Uh, so anyway, I, I told Jerry we had the deal, and I told him, I said, well, I need to get out of here for a little bit. So anyway, he knew Mr. Barnett, you know, that owned Georgia. And uh, he said, well, I'll get your book down there with Mr. Barnett. And which, you know, all them guys are big badass. What he thought, and I was, back when I first started, I probably was 190 to 210, you know, just uh, old cornbread country boy, you know, redneck. And uh, so anyway, I went down there, but he told me, he said, uh, if you get down there and it's a little more than you want, a little more than you handle, he said, just call me and uh, I'll talk to Jim and get you out of it. And I thought, you just, you're trying to plant that seed to make me come home. And so anyway, my, my first night in Atlanta, Georgia, it's at the Atlanta City Auditorium. And my wife, my mom, we drove down from Nashville, Tennessee to Atlanta. My mom, a friend of hers, and my little brother, and I just had me a nice red and white velvet robe made to the floor, you know, because I wanted to be styling in Atlanta. So anyway, I get in there, and of course, it's only Anderson's a booger, a booger and a prick booger. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, he knew how to draw money, so I can't say nothing. But anyway, he comes up to me, and, you know, he liked the bigger boys anyway. And I, you know, I had that fire. I wasn't a big boy, but I didn't die. And so he said, uh, well, you're going to wrestle Abdullah tonight. He's going to beat you in about 30 seconds, and then he's going to get color on you. And then Tony Atlas is going to come save you. I thought, damn, I better go call Jerry Jarrett right now. <laughs> so anyway, I went out there and we had the match. And when it's all over, I come back and do hit me on the leg. He said, thank you, kid. He said, I'll give that back to you one of these days. I thought, yeah, right. So anyway, then, but I wasn't about to go back to Tennessee because I knew that's what Jerry Jarrett wanted me to do. And uh, so I stayed and stuck it out. And only if it had been up to only, I think I'd have probably been gone. But Mr. Barnett liked me, and the people liked me, because they ain't never seen nothing like me. You know, because, you know, back in then, they, they, all the guys was big. I mean, the Mexicans, if they brought the Mexicans in, they were little, but that was a, you know, that was an every now and then thing. But as a rule, I mean, you know, little guys didn't get in the business. And uh, so anyway, I think if it had been up to him, but Mr. Barnett said, no, I want to keep him. And so I stayed, and uh, – They'd beat me, but I'd fire, you know. I mean, I wouldn't lay there and die. See, that's what a lot of the, a lot of the guys, because they get beat, it don't matter if you get beat or not. I can get beat and be over just as good if you know, if you got that psychology, which I don't teach today. If you got the psychology, it don't matter if you win or lose. 
uh, I've seen a lot of hills that would rather lose than they had win because they get more heat out of that by losing, you know. And uh, it just, uh, I mean, I just, it's always been, you know, whatever the situation is, I mean, and of course, I wasn't going to argue. Only told me to let the superstar beat me or whatever, but he'd beat the hell out of me if I'd tried to beat him, you know. But but it was just, it was a good business. And then, of course, I teamed up with Tony Atlas. Mm -hmm. And when me and Tony teamed up, <coughs> I become a blue eyed soul boy then. Not only did the white crowd like me, but the black folk loved me and I loved them too, you know. Mm -hmm. Me and Tony, we were the first. And, and when I'm talking about 1978, you know, they talk about racial stuff now. I mean, it's crazy now, but but back then it was still kind of real. They had still had signs in some of the little Georgia towns that said stuff that wasn't appropriate. And, uh, you know, so one night we were supposed to wrestle in Cummins, Georgia, and uh, they, had, well, they had one of them signs hanging up. And... Uh, so me and Tony always went everywhere together. And he told me, he said, he said, you go ahead and go on by yourself. He said, I think I might drive down. I might be a little late or something, he said. I said, Tony, I said, you better have your ass in that match. He said, and he told me, he said, I'm saying nothing to Ole. He said, but I ain't going to come in Georgia. He said, he said, they don't like me there. And which they would have loved him there. You know, he was Tony Adams, Mr. USA. And uh, so anyway, sure enough, we get there, though. Tony never showed up. <laughs> he didn't show up. And the people, you know, I mean, they didn't want their money back. But there was as many there want to see the, him as it was me, you know. But he just... He just believed that stuff. Mm. Was he was he gone just for that day? Or was he gone, gone, gone forever? Oh no, just for that day. He just didn't show up. Yeah. He, he, he said, but he said it. You know, he told him. He said, "I ain't going." Home. He said, "You better be there." He, but he would. <laughs> so, but but then, but like I said, me and him were the first Southern Georgia Southern heavyweight tag team champions that were black and white, salt and pepper. Mm. You know. So it, it was good because uh, Tony would go places with me and people would look at him, and I'd go places with him and people would look at me, you know. But they loved it because they knew who we were, you know. So it, it was – me and Tony, and we'd fly in. I had three daughters, and Tony would have – with my wife would come pick us up. He'd have one daughter on one shoulder and one on the other, going through the airport just cutting up. You know, he was – Tony was very good people. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I'm going to go back to something else you said as well, and you said that if it was up to Ole, he would have gotten rid of you. Uh, Ole, in general, what did you think of him as a booking mind, and what did you think of him as a boss? Ole, I mean, Ole had a great mind for this business. Ole was an asshole. You know, I think, I think, he, I think he wanted everybody not to like him so he wouldn't have to get close to nobody. I mean, you could have a conversation with him, you know, and, and which, like him and Stan Hansen got along some. But, uh, I mean, me and him didn't go out and eat no dinner together, you know. <laughs> Even if it wasn't – if Fabe was out the door, I still wouldn't have went and ate dinner with him. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go to a couple more Oli things then. Um, tell me, so apart from as a boss, apart from as a booker and everything, how good do you think Oli was as a main event talent? I draw money with him. I mean, uh, like, like when I went, once I got over, once I got over, say like you had the Rock and Roll Express and then you had all of them, all of the tag teams, right? But me, I would work singles. I'd work singles. And then once, you know, once my program was over, they bring Wahoo McDaniel in, and I'd team up with Wahoo, and we'd have a run with Ole and Gene or Ole and Ivan. Uh, and I'd do that run, and, and then I'd, so I'd go back into a single, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, my longevity was so good because I do I could do the tags, and they bring somebody new in, which made me fresh, and it got me out of the singles, you know. So I stayed fresh. I never – I never really had to leave. You know, a lot of guys, you had to travel to different territories. 
I was so blessed. I mean, the only, I might, I, if I decided I need to break, I'd go home to Tennessee and wrestle there. Yeah. Uh, you know. I was going to say, in 1979, you lost a hair versus hair match with Ole. How much of the hair did he take off? He took off. You know him, he's a prick. He took off enough. <laughs> I still had to get it cut. It looked like, you know, it looked like I had the mange. But, uh, but that's what draw business. And I didn't mind that stuff anyway. I mean, it grew, it grew back. But uh, it was the payoff that worth it. I, I give it. I'll give you an example oh. only. What, what, uh, well, I don't know if it's a business mind or just being a prick. You can flip a coin and you can decide. But anyway, we're wrestling in Marietta. We're wrestling in Marietta, Georgia. And uh, it holds maybe four or 5,000 people. I, I'm not really sure. But anyway, it's me and, and uh, Stan Hansen against Ole and Ivan Cola. So we're in the back. Ole says, what do y'all want to do? Well, me, I never said nothing because I was a little young punk in the room, so he did whatever I was told to do. I did. And uh, he said it a couple of times, and Stan Hansen looked at him. He said, well, you the fucking booker and get paid for it. He said, why don't you tell us what we want, what, what you want us to do? Ole said, okay, we'll go an hour Broadway. <laughs> I said, damn, Stan, maybe you should have said something. <laughs> See, anyway, and the house is sold out. It's sold slap out. We go out, boom, boom, boom. I mean, tear the house down, and uh, it was sold out. It was sold out. So we did the hour Broadway, come back the next week. It's got an hour and a half time. Then. Same shit. Oh, what do y'all want to do? By then, I was about ready to just say, beat me. But anyway, I didn't say nothing. Then again, Stan said, you the booker. What do, what do you want to do? And uh, he said, okay, we'll go an hour and a half Broadway. And I'm thinking, damn. So sure enough, so, and it sold out again. I mean, that's a long time with your other matches. And then an hour, and now you're going an hour and a half. It, then people it was getting out late. So anyway, we go out there. Sure enough, we go another hour and a half Broadway. Hmm. I'm like, man, next time just beat me. <laughs> so we come back the next week, two hour time limit. Uh, it's sold out again. Usually, if you usually when you do hour Broadway, it might fall off a little bit because the people were there so late or whatever. But it was sold slap out again. So we get back there. Say, what do y'all want to do? Hey, two hour Broadway, let's do it. And I thought, gee, you gotta be kidding me. And we went out there and we went and what nothing said about no finish. We went out there, we went. And they said an hour and 45 minutes. And I was in there with Ole. He said, uh, he stopped me. He said, duck the clothesline, Luthien's press. See, so anyway, in about an hour 50, I hit him with a Lufez press and got the three count, and that building went just blowed it out, you know, because they and it went so long they thought it was going to be another two hour Broadway, you know. But but three weeks in a row, an hour, hour and a half, and two hours, and they still had the other matches, and the people still come back. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, of the of the hour hour and a half uh, Broadways, what percentage of that were you in the ring? Uh, shoot, I, I, to be honest with you, I don't know. You, you would work and you'd get a hold and you'd work it. I mean, that's a long time. But with the tag, you could tag in and out and a little more razzmatazz. But it was, I tell you what, though, all of us back then had a pretty decent pace, too. Hmm. I mean, it, you'd get a hold. You'd get a hold and work it and let the guy sell. And you know what I'm saying? I mean, because that was my gig, selling. You know, I can, I can, I can, I, that's, that's what I love, dude. I, I, you look out and I'd have a little, two or three little girls be crying because they beat me up. You know, when you get them to do that, you doing, the, you're doing your job right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I'm actually going to move on to a bit of a game now. So I call it name association. I'm going to give you some sentences and you tell me uh, what wrestler from any, any era that you've met uh, that best fits that description. 
And the first one is funniest person in the locker room. Me. Now, Roddy Piper, I love Roddy Piper. He was funny. He was funny. Did he have specific uh, jokes or was it just his general demeanor? Just, just his natural personality. I mean, he might be playing a rib on you, might be playing a joke on you. Uh, I mean, I've had to knock two or three locks off my bag where he thought that, that was funny. It wasn't real funny to me, but Piper always thought it was funny. But, uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I'd say Roddy, yeah. Uh, next one is Last Man Standing at the Bar. Andre the Giant. Good man. Uh, do you know, this is probably a good time because I've already written this somewhere else. Uh, Andre the Giant, do, do you remember the first time you met him? Yes, sir, I most certainly do. Andre was a good friend of mine. I, uh, you know, I started wrestling in Tennessee. Well, we... Everybody was based out of Nashville because we do Memphis was this way and Louisville was that way. So most of the most of the guys in the territory lived in Nashville. So uh, anyway, I was going to tell you a quick story to get to that. Jerry Jarrett brought me. Jerry Jarrett brought me into business. I started in Tupelo, Mississippi, and then so I started making the loop. You know, so I had been. You know, I hadn't been working six months probably, and I just bought that other. You know, I seen all them driving them Lincolns and Cadillacs. I said, "Oh yeah, baby!" But uh, first car I had was old seventy three LTD, and then and then I bought me that seventy six Oldsmobile Regency. It, it was long like a Cadillac, but it wasn't a Cadillac. But anyway, Andre was dressing in Louisville, Kentucky, and so they asked me would I give. Andre a ride back to Nashville. And I, how, how can I – nobody liked to take him because they said he broke their seats, you know. And uh, so I said, I don't care if he rides with me or not. And so anyway, so the manager over – and he had just got here too, so he didn't speak a little, little English. He had a, a translator, Frenchie, with him. And uh, he was at the hotel because they'd had a long flight or something. Me and Andre get in my Regency. Well, we go over the Holiday Inn, and it's got like a little horseshoe drive, and it's got a little concrete curve sitting up on it. And that, that Regency looked longer than what I was used to. I wheel that thing in, and on Andre's side, the tires run up on the curb. That car went oh, boom, yeah, boom. And, of course, with as heavy as he was, it come down hard. I was holding that steering wheel like a – Oh, God, I hope you don't slap me. I hope you don't slap me. You know, but he's that I am. So we get Frenchy, though, and this, this is the most stands out in my mind about it. I mean, Andre was as good a guy. I mean, I never met as nice a person as him. And uh, I hate, you know, it's one thing he wrestled. And he, he was a freak of nature. But just people are cruel sometimes. You know, they say shit that they shouldn't even be said, you know. And because he was just the nicest man I ever met. So anyway, we get we get Frenchy, and uh, he said, "Beer, beer." He knew beer and balls, <laughs> beer and balls, beer balls. And back then, I wasn't but eighteen. I said, and I drank like even a little seven ounce Millers, eight little eight packs of them. I said, I said, yeah, I'll take an eight pack of them little pony Millers, right? So him and Frenchy come in. Go in. I stayed in the car. When they come out, they both got two big boxes with them. They bought me six eight packs of beer. I said, No, no. I said, We won't never make home. Give me an eight pack, put the rest in the trunk. But Andre had bought him a case of quart bottle beers. So it was like his hand holding that quart. Looked like me holding that seven. I mean, he was just a huge man. My wife, he hurt his ring. It would fit on three of her fingers. You know, uh, you know Rick Martell. Of course, yeah. Well, so after all of that, after that, I went to Atlanta. Well, me and Rick teamed up in Atlanta as tag team. You know, we won the belts, as a matter of fact. But anyway, anytime Andre come in. We was who he wanted to go with. Of course, Ricky knew him, French Canadian, 
and I took him in Louisville, you know, and so he and he liked me. Uh, you know, I don't know how we didn't have much conversation, but anyway, he liked me, I guess. Because anytime he come in, he wanted us. And we would hate for him. I mean, we'd love to see him, but we'd hate for him to come. Because as soon as the matches were over, it was bar time. <laughs> and and he could drink, but but what would happen, he he would really add y'all, but you know, you drink make me one of them. See, anyway, one night, it was a Sunday night at the Omni. You know, during the week, everything closed at 3. On Sunday, it closed at 12. Well, me and Rick and Bob, we hugging each other. Said, man, 12 o'clock, if we can just hang on to then, we ain't going to be sick or nothing. And uh, so anyway, 12 o'clock hit, and uh, Andre come up and he said, no, we went up to him and said, you had to go, boss? He said, yeah, he said, maybe, maybe we go after I was bar down. And I lived in Atlanta for a year and a half till you didn't have nothing about no after hours bar now. <laughs> Andre come in and out of here and he knew where everything in the world was. So here we go. And it, like we ran the Omni that night. We well, always supposed to dry, dress nice, you know, for the Omni. So that day I went and bought me a hundred and fifty dollar, like a Pants, you know, back powder blue, you know, uh, thought I slick. So anyway, we say, yeah, we'll go down there with you. So we get to the bar down there. And I walk up the bar, me and Ricky with him. He said, what do you want to drink? And I drink, every now and then I drink some vodka and grapefruit. And that was a bad night to do it. But anyway, the guy, he made me one. I just turned it up and killed it. I said, fuck on, I said, I ain't nothing in that drink. He said, he said, bartender. He said, that's the dumbest thing I can say. Because the next time wasn't no grapefruit in it. So I still <laughs> had to drink it anyway. So at three o'clock, like as you, it, but when you come in the door, there was a, like a bench this way and a bench this way. So we went in. So, and I, I hadn't seen Ricky in a while. I didn't know where he was. But about three o'clock, they started cooking breakfast. And I was told, up. you know how food smells sometimes. Yeah. Anyway, that's cooking bacon. All the people ordered bacon and all that stuff. I sit there and said, so I jumped up and I run to the bathroom. Well, they had the little pee thing, and then they had the stall. I put the stall was locked. Somebody was in there. So I said, I went right to the little train, man. I'm all like, eh. All of a sudden, I hear somebody in there doing the same damn thing. Come to find out, it was Ricky Martell. He was in there sick. He done got sick, too. So we went out. I was laying on one of the male shaped be one of the benches, and Ricky was laying on the other one. Andre, now, he sat in there and ate his breakfast and everything. And people was coming in. They'd say, look, there's Tommy Rich and Rick Martell. <laughs> so, so finally, Andre comes out. He picks Ricky up in one arm and me in the other. And, uh, and I didn't even know he could drive. Ricky, Ricky had a 73 LT uh, Thunderbird, 73 Thunderbird then. And anyway, he put us put Ricky in the pass. I got in the back. Ricky got in the pass side. And, of course, I don't know how he drove, but he did. So, But anyway, as we're going back, I done throwed up all I could. But you know how you get in dry heaves? Mm -hmm. Well, in that, on that 73 Thunderbird, it'll hand up a little smoke one. You know, it didn't open about that far, so you couldn't get your head out. <laughs> so I had to take my new $150 suit jacket, and I was dry heaving in it. Yeah, oh, I was sick of the dog. Got up the next day. I was going to take it and clean it. I said, throw it in the trash. I was <laughs> mad. I was mad at Andre. I said, son of a gun, he gets us every single time. That's the problem he, when he's always I mean, picking he, up the tab as well, isn't it? When somebody else is picking up the oh, tab, yeah, the drinks yeah. go down quicker. Yeah. Oh, but it, he he would he he wouldn't make you drink, but he'd make you feel like you needed to drink. Yeah. With, you know, come on, boss. You know, and you say okay, but hell, he could drink probably. Uh, you know, ain't no telling how much Andre could drink on a good day when he wanted to.
Right, so so the next question I've got is the most beautiful woman uh, wrestler slash valet in the business. Uh, it's hard because I, I, you know, I don't watch, I don't watch a lot of the new well, stuff. In your day. In my day. In your day. The fabulous Moolah. <laughs> Never. Not a chance. You remember, you remember, her? You remember her? Of course that I do, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why I know you're lying. Back, <laughs> them ladies back then were built to fight. They wasn't built to be pretty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I, back then, I mean, I don't know. Uh, they, they, did none of them look like they do today. I know that. Yeah. No, fair enough then. Um, the most untrustworthy person you ever met in the wrestling business? Moose. <laughs> oh, he's not in here. Never mind. Uh, I don't know. You know, I, I'm a pretty straight up person. And, and uh, I don't dig, you know, like if I, if I feel like somebody's BSing with me, I just, I, I, don't, I don't like to deal with that kind of stuff. Mm. And there's, uh, Moose, I was going to ask him who he thought it would be. Uh, no, it's okay. Well, this this next question. I mean, is... but like Nick Goulas, as far as like that that did, didn't pay you what you should get. Uh, you know, it's like me. Uh, I wrestled in Georgia, but they they would want to book me off of that TV, but did not them like me because they like Doctor Dead, the big guy. But I went to work for Bill Watts. Wrestled at the Superdome, uh, and I was on like fourth from the top, hot off Atlanta TV. I didn't draw the whole house, but I drove some of it. You know how much I got made for the Superdome? Five hundred. A hundred and fifty dollars. Wow. And we wrestled Saturday night in Carrollton, Georgia. Don't hold but eight hundred people, and I got paid that. I'd make a hundred fifty dollars in Carrollton, Georgia. Then I went to. For Eddie Graham, I went, and we wrestled in uh, the Bayfront or St. Peter Bayfront or something. Cars, I was late getting there because there's so much traffic trying to get in. You know how much I made for that show? Oh, don't make me guess. I'll say five hundred again. One hundred fifty dollars. I was $150. And then the same thing with Crockett. You know, and I told and Mr. Barnett, he asked me, he said, well, why don't you like to work with this guy? I said, well, Mr. Barnett, I worked for you. And I understand that because of the TV we have, that it helps these other promoters. I said, but but you hired me, and if I can't make no more than $150, I'd rather be home working our towns. I said, I'd go to Carrollton and make $150, Mr. Barnett, and not have to get a hotel and be home, whatever, just whatever, you know. And he and – he, and after that, I didn't. I didn't make too many after that. Now I would make them. I would go like when NWA started going down. Like Bob Geigel was a good friend of Mr. Barnett, and I like Bob Geigel. Harley Race from some, from was from up there, and Harley Race. I mean, I love Harley. Harley. If it wasn't for Harley, I'd have never won the world heavyweight title. That was his idea. So, so like, if they needed me to go up there. I didn't mind going because if it drawed, I know Mr. Geigel, but they wasn't doing good anyway. I, I didn't care if I went up there. They'd get my hotel room. Uh, but if I made $40, I mean, if it's a shit house, I didn't care if they paid me $40. That was, you know, uh, the sheik, Eddie Farhead, I couldn't do the show for him because it, he was going down. And, uh, and of course, we, we said that was – we wrestled National Guard Army there, though, and hell, there was many people on the outside of the building that was inside. And that's when I knew Tommy Rich was a hot commodity because he just had his underneath boys, and it was just me and him there. And, uh, and so I, I kind of got it then. But like I said, uh, I mean, somebody was in my same spot and did the same match I did. If it be, if had been, say, Dusty Rhodes, he'd probably made three to $5,000. And they give me a hundred feet, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so I always, you know, 
I was a rebel too. I'm, I'm a rebel because I don't give I don't give a crap. I I go in that ring. I do my job, and and I and I do everything they ask me. And then and that was my deal. And then that's all you that's all they can do if you go do what they ask you. But if they don't like your habits, let's just say I don't like your habits. Uh, I can drink a six pack of beer and have ten times better match than than I would if I hadn't drank one. You know, it, very damn sure wouldn't be no worse. You know what I'm saying? Like some folks are get mad because I drink beer and wrestling, but after the matches, they all out take it, yanking their britches down on the bar, drink, and just doing stuff that I didn't even do. I just drank and, and went and did my job. And if they told me to go an hour Broadway, I'd go an hour Broadway. They want 45 minutes, and that's fine too. And never once did I have a problem, you know. And, and, and it, it was a couple of guys that had remarks about it. I ain't gonna say their name because I don't. I let all. Of, I don't dislike nobody. If you dislike somebody, then then they got you beat. You know. Exactly. Used to I had a couple of people that I thought, ooh, I hate them so bad, and I said I ain't doing that no more. But it was, you know, like I don't know. I got lost. What was the question? Oh, it's miles away now. I think I'll just move on to the next question. Don't worry. <laughs> I think it was uh, originally we were talking about the most untrustworthy p- people uh, you met in the business. Well, I don't know. They, they was untrustworthy to me if they didn't pay me my money. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Then. I mean, but, but other folks, I mean, they didn't have no problem with but. It, it is, it is a real, I mean, I never had no problem in the business, you know, because I always did my job. Uh, and I was, a, I was a kid in the 80s, man. The 80s was beautiful. You know, it was uh, just a different time. And the, the wrestling fans, I mean, old school wrestling. I mean, you think about it. These big companies would come and run these towns, say, once every three months, right? So, so they'll come in and they'll give some tickets away, but they might fill it up. But the next time they come, half of the people that was there ain't going to be there. But because their TV draws are good, they'll pick up another bunch of people to come. But they can't draw the same like, like, like just like this. Like in, on Monday, we'd go to Augusta, Georgia. Tuesday would be Macon, Georgia. Wednesday, we'd go to Columbus, Georgia. Thursday, we'd do Athens or Rome, Georgia one because you couldn't run them weekly. Then uh, Friday was Atlanta City Auditorium. Then Saturday morning, you'd get up and have to be at TV probably around nine or something, and they'd do a TV taping. Then you had to just – you had to maybe put a T-shirt on, leave your tights on, jump in your car, hit the drive through and drive to Columbus, Georgia, which was like a hundred and they didn't have the interstate, then probably 110 miles, but it was two lane road all the way. So you had to haul butt to get there for that live TV. Then you'd go somewhere and wrestle that night. You know, so so in them days you're getting like in six days, getting nine shots out of you. And then they found out Sundays would work. And so we started doing them too. So we was working 10 times a week. And then on the holidays, they do a Christmas day, Christmas day night show, mm-hmm. and then a Christmas night show. So they was getting two out of that Thanksgiving, you know. Yeah, and Thanksgiving uh, as well. Yeah, they were big shows. Thanksgiving shows yeah, as well, weren't and they? That, and that's when they did the big shows. Yes, yeah. but but and and you didn't you didn't even think about it. some of these kids today. If they had to do the miles we did, and which George I love George, I'm, but like Watts' territory and Crockett. In Florida, I mean, they had some long trips. And out in Texas, too. You know, I was lucky. Tennessee was so-so. But uh, and I spent most of my time in Georgia. Mm. So them trips were just beautiful. Shoot, any town you see, and I could be back in time to hit the strip. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to ask you this next one, then. The uh, wrestler who most needed to go to the laundry more than they uh, did that you wrestled. The smelliest. I 
Ah, usually somebody stunk, I only tell them to take a bath. He may he tell them. I mean, you get there's a couple that you'd spell, but I just offhand, I don't remember. But there's a couple. Well, I'll tell you, I'll give you, I'll tell you who the worst one would have been would have been Buddy Roberts. <laughs> one of the three birds, Buddy Roberts. Yeah. He would be the worst one. They was telling me they was in Louisiana and uh you know, they used to play ribs on each other. Anyway, somebody put a dead possum in his bag, and he, and for some reason, he hadn't had to open his bag for a week or so. Got the show, pulled it out. They said it had maggots. He brushed them off and put the tights on. So he's about the nastiest one I can tell you about. Yeah, because I do remember that story. I was just amazingly, you're not the first person to tell me that story as well. You're not the first person to say Buddy Roberts. Uh, I'll ask you a couple more, then we'll then we'll uh, carry on. Um, the heaviest smoker of cigarettes. Uh, what kind? Uh, any just just regular packs of cigarettes. Not not the uh, sticky icky not green. The not the lefty kind. Uh, no, no. A lot of the guys, I mean, Dick Slater smoked some, uh, but I don't know if he would have been the worst one. I don't know, because uh, most of them didn't smoke in the dressing room. You know, they didn't smoke in the dressing room too much. And if you didn't run around with them, you know, we, a lot of us didn't run around like they'd be like we'd have our little me and. Nick Patrick, the referee, maybe my cousin Johnny and Brad Armstrong. We ride together, you know, and didn't know them even smoke cigarettes. I'll move on <laughs> then. I'll move on. Cigarettes. Uh, I'll move on then. Uh, the most legit. You ain't going to ask who smoked the most left handed? You could do, yeah. Uh, yeah. Who, I who... did. It was me. <laughs> Good man. It was medicinal, though. It of course was medicinal. It was. You got the glaucoma going, have you? Yes, sir. Yes, I got bad anxiety too. <laughs> yeah, I can tell you, you're Look at that finger, shrinking violet. Plus the pain, that finger, it won't open up. Ooh. I mean, you see that finger? Yeah. Can you see that? You see how big that knuckle is? Yeah. You know, I did that wrestling. And you know why it's like that? Because, because back in the day, if you didn't wrestle, you didn't get paid. So I couldn't take it and have it done and have, you know, have that brace on it because you poke a guy's eye out. Plus it'd get hit all the time too. So I just, what I ended up doing was taping the two fingers together and uh, just, and it, that's what it's done over the year. And I did that. What had happened, me and Roddy Piper, my cousin Johnny was coming back from Columbus, Ohio to Atlanta. And we're coming up the escalator. This guy in front of me started getting really smart, saying something. We ain't even said nothing to him, you know. Um, and he turned around, got like toward my face while I pushed him. He fell down on the escalator. Well, we was at the top, so he jumped up and got off. Well, we got off. He went this way. We went that way. We're walking across the airport. All of a sudden, my, I go, oh, my God. He had took and threw a rock across the airport and hit me in my knuckle. Hit me in my knuckle. And I, I thought, what the heck? And uh, so anyway, it was broke. It was broke. And so in a few minutes, we could, well, oh no, we turned around and chased his ass down is what we did. I shoved him down. His keys fell out. My cousin Johnny took throw his keys Throwed his keys, so we're going back across the airport again. All of a sudden, I guess he threw another rock, but it hit that big metal conveyor belt. The bags come in, sound like a shotgun or something. Cannon. Anybody, there were two cops there, and they said, what was that? Guy over there just threw a rock. Boy, they took off over that way. We took <laughs> off running out the door. So we, yeah, yeah. But it was, it was crazy, man. Man, so what is what's going on there? So is it is it all calcified now? I mean, can you get an operation to file it down now, or or, or what's the score with it? Well, it, I guess I could go to the doctor, you know, and I guess I can do something about it. 
But it, you know, I've had it's been like this so doggone long. It don't bother me no more. No. <laughs> Fair enough. Then I'll ask you a couple more. Then um, the most memorable backstage fight. Shoot, about the only backstage fight I ever seen was uh, wrestling too, and uh, Frankie Kane in Macon, Georgia, one night, and uh, Frankie. I don't know. I it, uh, I think Frankie Kane came out on top at the end of the day. He might have bid him to do it, but he was on top. <laughs> you know, you know, street fights a street fight. Yeah. Uh, most most uh, oh sorry most a uh, best enhancement talent jobber that you ever wrestled or that you would look forward to wrestling. Just somebody like on TV that you just beat. Yeah, yeah. George South, I'd say George South. As far as I didn't rouse him a lot, but as far as uh, a really good hand, George South is, is is good. That's that was his cup of tea. And Mike Jackson was another good one. He'd come to Georgia. Mike Mike was good, mm. you know. Uh, and when I first started wrestling, I'd go down for Nick, and we'd wrestle in Birmingham TV. And Mike would come in there back then, you know. So, but yeah, I'd say, I would say Mike, and, and of course, and then they, and then both of them on top of, on top of that, they would get the, they would be the bookers of the the job guys that they needed. Yeah. So they, yeah, I'd, I would say them too, just off the top of my head. Okay, and very last one is the most talented wrestler you ever ever worked with. Besides me? Besides you, well, you well, you can work with yourself, but uh, uh, the most talented wrestler you work with. I worked with the Invisible Man one time, so that was pretty <laughs> much me. No, Harley Race. I love wrestling Harley Race. Just simple as that. He was just the man. Yeah. Oh, he's a general. He's a general. You know, I uh, I know Terry Dory and the Briscoes. They were all champions, but. They were like when I got in, they they were you know they weren't the champ. Harley was the champ, and so I always got. And any time Harley comes to Atlanta, I always got to wrestle. And I guess that's because they all liked to wrestle me because they were all older guys, and you know two older guys beating up on each other. You know, like wrestling too, you can do that with because they love wrestling too. But like they all want to wrestle me because they knew they could beat the shit out of me, and the people get to get that sympathy, and then me make that comeback, and uh, and so they, you know, I, I, I just I never had no play. They all him. That's what I told somebody the other day. I said, you know, I mean, you think about the guys: Black Jack Lanza, Baron Von Rasky, Ox Baker, King Kong Mosca, the Briscoes, the Funks. Uh, Ole and G, Stan, all them guys, man. And and that's not even half of them that come through Atlanta that I got to wrestle. So I got to wrestle, you know, the best of the best. And that, that was the good thing about the territory. These kids down these independent shows. Well, they first off, they are they watch the new stuff and they don't understand. They don't understand like we're in West Virginia right now. I mean, West Virginia. And then, and then West Virginia Rednecks, they like to see – Oh, they want to believe. They still want to believe. Like last night, we went to that show, and I went out as a babyface manager. And uh, so they they were figuring their finish out. I said, wait a minute. I said, let me let, let, listen to me. I said, I'm not going to be back here. I said – Listen to my idea and tell me, and and I because I already told them they all like to try to do them long dragged out finishes that they can't remember, and the fans don't get either. I told I said simpler is better, the simpler the better. See so the way we did a little deal. I went out with the baby faces, uh, cut my prior. It's uh because West Virginia we used to be up here out there. Man, it's been so long. I used to love to come to West Virginia. I, I said, I got cousins up here, you know, just carrying on and told them what a pleasure, blah, 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 blah. 
Well, at the end of the match, they got in the four way, shot their boys together. Well, the babyface guy was managing. The boy was getting up. He hit the rope, going to hit him with the thin press. I grabbed his doggone leg. He tripped, and the boy covered him, and I held his leg. One, two, three. Oh, them, everybody in there believed that. I had one woman. <laughs> she was so damn mad. She was going to get up. I told her husband, I said, you better sit down and make her sit down, too. He, knew, he didn't say nothing, but he was mad in hell, too. He wanted to get up, but he knew better, you know. I might have had to run from him, but he, he I didn't have to worry about it because he didn't get up. <laughs> but yeah, they was I was mad. But just a simple, simple little screw finish like that. You ain't got to jump off the top of a building. It's like a, a power driver used to be a finish. You and we even back when I you'd go to the hospital, you know, or get carried out in the ambulance and come back with a neck neck collar. And uh now they give you two power drivers. She, and you and they'll beat you up for you can get up, you know. I just that see, and, and that's what makes us business, and, and that's what I try to tell them, you know, because that's what Jerry Jerry. I don't know if you ever seen him in Tojo Yamoto fight. I don't know if you watch the old film, but anyway, Jerry, that's that's what I was taught to do was sell because I was that little guy like Jerry Jerry, and uh, and so I loved, you know, I love selling. Tony, Tony Atlas, 270 pounds. He told me one night, because he'd get the big pile. My deal was I'd get him started up. Then when I tagged Tony, it'd be woo, like that. And he told me one night, he said, I'm selling tonight. I said, Tony, that's my job. I said, you're too damn big to sell. He said, what? And where he watched me, and it's one thing to be the little fella, but and he was as big or maybe bigger than some of the hills, but he he would have him people eating out of his hand. Only get so mad at him, he'd say, He's supposed to sell, you're supposed to come back. He said, I told him I was selling, you know. Only couldn't only didn't like it, but he wouldn't say nothing about it because he was drawing money, you know. And Tony loved doing it, but he got he got the point. The people want to see you get beat down so they can holler for you to come back. And with what's going on today, there ain't no beat down to this. It's just spot, 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 spot. They don't even have time to recognize what's going on. Yeah, you absolutely. Know? So that's what I try to – I try. Like, most of these kids, they watch a WWE or something, and they think they know it all anyway. But, I, like, I talked to a couple of kids last night. And, and, and was telling the psychology. I did a seminar. I said, y'all know how you got to train and teach how to take bumps. I said, what we're going to do is talk about the psychology of the business and, you know, get more out of it like that. I mean, of course, I talked to Moose till I was blue in the face. He still can't do nothing. <laughs> except keep leaving me stranded. Oh, Moose, I didn't see you, baby. Hey, hey, <laughs> Let me ask you a question. You drink? I drink, yeah. What do you like? Uh, I'll drink anything. I'll drink. A, I'll drink a champagne. I'll drink a rum and coke. I'll drink a, just lager. I'll drink. Oh, I'll drink so I, if it's wet. I'll drink it. Oh, so you like? Oh, you're a pro. Yeah, I, yeah. You you mix them up a bit. You make things interesting. If, yeah. If I if I drank that combination you just said, I'd have to get up in between this interview and be outside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, boy, if I mix it. Well, it's a Sunday afternoon. What is that? Just a bit of rum and just a bit of, uh, you know, just a single a rum, rum and a bit of Coke, yeah. And a bit of Coke, a bit of rum and a bit of Coke. Yeah. just. I love I love y'all's accent, man. <laughs> I'm glad you can understand it. So many people, for some reason, can't understand my accent. Well, you know why I can? Because I'm cornbread. <laughs> See, you, right. you, can, you understand me, too. I understand you just fine. Yeah, but we get all the yeah, American but, movies but, over here, so you know Yankees, we get all the accents. Yankees, the Yankees don't. The Yankee folk, they don't understand. They act like they don't anyway. They don't like us. But yeah, uh, I understand you real well, as a matter of fact. Oh, thank you. It's the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me. Yeah, I, I understand. <laughs> hey, how old did you say you was? I'm 35. 35. Ooh. Good age to get married, supposedly. Yeah, 
if you think it's the right one, 35, that's you've waited long enough. She ought to be the right one. Mm, yeah, well, I've waited long but enough. But it's, it's hard now. I'm going to tell you, it's hard now. It's a uh, Lord. Don't nobody stay, stay married. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know. Like me and my wife, I met her in Atlanta. You know, I told you I like, used to like run that strip. I met her, her. We hung out at a bar called D Fords, and she worked there as a waitress, and I met her. And uh, anyway, we moved in together for about two or three years, decided we wanted some young ones. Uh, went to Tennessee, and Jerry Jarrett married us. He was the uh, county commissioner. So we went to Tennessee and went to the Gallatin Courthouse, and Jerry Jarrett married me and my wife. <laughs> so, uh, and, and it worked 45 years married as well, so – you know, or you can't. It's not all down to Jerry, but maybe he had something to do with it. He married you well. Well, he didn't marry himself well with his. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's been with his last one for a little bit. I don't think it was his first one very long. Uh, I'm I'm going to launch back into the interview, and one thing I'm very keen to hear about your perspective on Black Saturday and. Georgia being sold, or you Briscoes selling their stock in Georgia to Vince McMahon. Were you in the territory at the time? And if you weren't, can you tell me what you learned about the process uh, or what you heard about it back in 84? Hey, Moose, come here and listen to this question. You might know a better answer to it than me. Wait a minute. Let James tell you this and see if you know. I, I know what you're talking about, but What's the question? It was Black Saturday. Uh, Tommy was in the area, I think, when at least the shares yeah, were being sold, if not sold to Vince McMahon. I was wondering his uh, his memories of the time and, and what he knew. That's when Georgia Championship Wrestling, when they bought the TV slot on TBS, and, and the WWF was on there for one year. And then I guess they, uh, they sold the rights to that back to Crockett one year later in that finance WrestleMania. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah, that's pretty much right. Yep. Is yeah. that right? Say, say he, say he knows, like, I tell you something behind the scenes, but he knows the <laughs> politic of promotion end of it. I'll, I'll give you another question then. That was probably a bad question. I'll tell you what then. Um, well, not really, because I mean, that's a good question, but I mean, I just did not, because that's the reason I want to hear the answer too. You know, I mean, yeah, I figured most of no. Yeah, well, he no, did, and if he didn't, he might allow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you one. I know that you know then, um, and it's it's the question you've probably been asked more than any other. And the NWA title change, you beat Harley Race. But before we talk about the match itself, I don't think many people realise how many times you challenged Harley Race for the NWA world title. Was it because Harley loved you, or was it because you were just the best person for the job, or why were you always well, paired I, with Harley? I mean, like in Georgia, what? Like, of course, world champion, he would be in this territory for a couple of days and next one for a couple of days. But when he come to Georgia, it was pretty much – it was pretty much – like, when I first got there, wrestling too would wrestle him a lot. But then, you know, as I got over – and me and Harley – me and Harley, Harley liked me because he knew I liked to drink beer and Harley liked to drink beer. But uh, Harley was just – like I said, I think – I. You go way back, and I know Terry and, and Dory and them guys, they wrestled and Terry, you know, one of the best. Well, they're always one of the best. But just for me, for me, getting in there with Harley, it was just – and I and I hated to go an hour, but if it was with Harley, I hoped we win an hour, you know, because that's just, that's just how much – it was fun with Harley. You know, he'd make it fun. You, you'd be laying there trying to be serious, and he'd be blowing on your side, you know, <laughs> you know with me. He'd be, always be messing with me, you know. But, but me and him had – me and Harley had a real and, – and I don't know why. He just, he just liked me. And, and, but we had a real good friendship. And uh, I, I remember one night with me, and I think with Rick Martell, we're coming back from Augusta, Georgia, and I had a Trans Am now. All of a sudden, I feel something bump my car, but I don't see no lights. It's dark. What the hell is that? 
all of a sudden, again, it hits me now, but it's pushing me. I was doing about 90, now I'm doing 100. And, of course, I can't remember who they look. They said, that's a damn Harley. I mean, yeah, he'd come up, you know, he just loved doing that kind of stuff. You know, but that's what broke the monotony on the road, you know. It was, we had fun. Hmm. We had fun, you know. I mean, uh, there, some guys would run with these guys and some with these guys. Uh, but, the, like, it, most of the guys was really cool. I, like Bobby Heenan. I love Bobby Heenan. Uh, you wrestled Bobby Heenan as well. I don't know how many people realize that Bobby Heenan wrestled singles matches in Georgia in 1979. Yeah, yeah I wrestled Bobby a few times. Mm. I wrestled him. I beat Lads or something and got five minutes with him. But I wrestled Bobby a few times. Did he come over he as a manager? Sorry. Sorry. No, I, I, was, I, I was asking, did Bobby come over as a manager slash wrestler, or was he just coming over as a wrestler? No, he came over as a manager. I think he was I think he was managing when he come in, he was mad, managing Black Jack Lance. With um with the NWA world title change. Harley Race himself has said that it was something to do with the power struggle between Ole and Jim Barnett. Do you remember the power struggle that was going on between them and what the issue was between them, to, those two? I think, you know who Fred Ward, or not, yeah, Fred Ward, he was a promoter down in uh, Columbus, Georgia. Well, his, son, his son-in-law, guy married his daughter, I think he that him uh, Ralph was his name Ralph. I think Ralph and only because Mr. Barnett kind of let them run it. You know he was just oh, and I think they kind of finagled him out of it. It was it was a story to it, which I don't know because that kind of stuff. I wasn't a politician man, and I don't I don't know a lot about that. But I know I know I heard the story that they screwed him out of. Out of out of the deal or something for some somehow, and Mr. Barnett's a smart man, so I don't know how they did it, but but that was a story I heard. How did that how did that lead to Harley Race losing the title to you? Then was it just to annoy somebody? That was Harley's or... idea. Harley's right back then. You know, you had to put ten grand up for the belt because the jewelry jewels. Were... I didn't even have to put the ten grand up. Harley left his 10 grand, you know, he said, I'll put, just leave mine there. And I'll take care of the kid. Yeah. You know, they all call me the kid, but, but that's what I'm saying. It was, you know, just the respect I had. And of course, yeah, I was, of course, my mom would slap me if I didn't say yes, sir. No, sir. Anyway, I mean, respect. That's, that's why, of course, back then, that's why he's brought up anyway. If I had to say, if I, like, if I had said yes or no, but somebody at school got in trouble, she, I'd get home, she'd slap me in the mouth too. She'd say, boy, you know better. And now now you can't even get on to your kids for doing something wrong. Hmm. You know, it's uh, I think it's crazy. I mean, I used to think mama used to beat me to death, but I think it made me a better person. I knew what was right from wrong, hmm. you know. And, and especially like in Stu, you could – Shane, I was talking to Shane Douglas. And, uh, you know, he teaches school or he did. And they can't, they can't say nothing to them kids no more. I'd be fired my first day because the first one that said something, they'd be bent over getting them three licks like I got when I was a kid. Yeah. Can I ask you this then? Uh, how long before you had that title belt in your hands did you realize you were going to win it? Oh, I didn't know that night. I didn't know till we got ready to go over the finish. Mm. Yeah, they didn't tell me, you know, Harley won't surprise me. Andre, Andre, Andre was there, uh, you know, and didn't nobody else expect me to beat him either, you know. But anyway, boy, when I got that three count, that building went, uh, but, but Augusta, it wasn't on this size, but it was a big building, and but the acoustics was good. And Andre come down to the ring, couple of guys. Andre put me up on his shoulder. I mean, it was it was good. Probably, well, of course, to win the NWA World Heavyweight title, the biggest thing in the business back when wrestling was wrestling, and to be in that group with them guys, the biggest honor of my life. But I have people say, "Well, 
was that your best match? That was my best match for the world heavyweight title. <laughs> but I wrestled Abdullah the Butcher. You know, people say, is he hard to work with? Well, when I first left Tennessee and went to Georgia, Ole Anderson was a booker. So, anyway, I drove down from Nashville, but my mom, my little brother, and a friend of hers come down to watch and see because, you know, we used to go to Chattanooga and you'd watch Channel 17 on TV. You could see it after we got through wrestling. We'd go eat. You'd be on TV come down and we'd say, yeah, boy, you ever make it to Georgia? That's that big time wrestling. Mm. So anyway, boy, I thought, man, I'm on my way to the big time. Get that. And I had me a long red and white velvet robe made to the floor. I mean, nice. And so we get there, go in. And, of course, I didn't know nobody. And I was, you know, maybe 19 or 20, but then 19, I think. And uh, – so I didn't know nobody talked to or nothing. So I went to the dressing room. Nobody nice introduced herself and everything. And of course, I was hey boy, what's your name? I'm Tommy Rich. He said, Oh, okay. You're working with Abdullah. And then not how you doing, fuck you, nothing. You're working with Abdullah. Uh, he's gonna beat you in 30 seconds. You're gonna get juice. And uh Tony Ellis is gonna come down and save you. Well, Jerry Jerry told me if I got down there. And it had any problems, he'd call, call me and I'll get you back home, get you out of it, you come back home. I thought, damn, this is awful quick. They had to call him. But I said, no, I ain't calling him. Hmm. So we went out there, did the deal, went out and did it, and uh, come back. He said, thank you, kid. He said, I'll give that back to you one day. Hmm. I thought, <laughs> yeah, right, you will. And uh, – so about a year, year and a half went by, and we was at the Omni on Thanksgiving night. And Wahoo was supposed to wrestle Abdullah in the main event. Well, Wahoo and Ole always was fussing and fighting. They both stubborn. So anyway, Wahoo quit. The day before the show, Wahoo quit. And he did, and he thought they was going to beg him to come, you know, I, I don't know what the deal was. But anyway, I think at the end of the day, Wahoo, kind of like a kid, thought they was going to talk him, beg him to come back or whatever, and they didn't. So, you know, we you got to be there an hour early. <clears throat> so, only oh, asked Abdul, he says, well, who do you want to wrestle? Wahoo ain't going to be here. He said, give me the kid. Oh, he said, the kid? He said, yeah, the blind-headed kid. He said, you talking about Tommy? He said, yep. And see, only didn't even like that deer. But by that, by that time, I'm, I'm, you know, me and Tony's done been tagged. Thing. So I'm over. He, he couldn't stop it. You know, if he wanted to, he couldn't have stopped me getting over. Because, and I didn't know I was getting over. But that desperation fighting and not giving up and cornbread interviews, then people in Georgia ain't never seen nothing like that. So anyway, me and Abdullah go out there for the match. And, uh, of course, they got the rail around the ring. You ain't supposed to get out. You ain't supposed to get on the floor. Don't get outside that rail for damn sure. So we're going in there, boom, 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 boom. And he says, follow me. Oh, he rolls out to the floor. We get out there inside and fight around that rail. How you doing? Fight, we're fighting around that rail. Anyway, he rolls back in. He's following the kid. So he rolls out. This time, we're over the rail. So we go back so far, and then the bleachers start going up. So we fight to, about to bleed and turn around. We come back, get in the ring. We do a couple things. He says, follow me. This time we fight all the way up there, you know, up, in, up high in the building. We come back down. And then people, of course, when Abdullah would come out, it'd be like the, the, the kids were scared. It'd be like the partner of the Red Sea. He'd come up, and everybody would go run over each other trying to get away, you know. And uh, so anyway, we get back in the ring now. I'm hitting it, boom, 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 boom. He said, and th now you got a picture of this too. Back then, that's in uh, 80, I don't know. But anyway, that's when Abdullah was at his biggest. He was like 
right at 400 to 450 pounds. I mean, he was huge. And I was, I was 190 to 210, you know. So I'm in there, I'm hitting him, boom, 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 boom. He says, slam me, kid. Boom, <laughs> boom, boom. I, I didn't even rest. Boom. He said, I said, slam me. I said, Abby, I said, I can't slam you. And, you know, you see no high spot where the heel goes and slam the baby face, but he blocks it, and, and, and then the baby face slams the heel. I thought he was going to do a reverse on me. I was just going to go pick him up. I couldn't get him up and look like a fool, right? So anyway, he said, damn it, I said, slam me. I went down and got him, and I went up with him, and he was as light as I was. You'd have never – I mean, I had him. I'd have been, I'd have thought, I'd have, I'd have, if I'd have got him to here, I'd have thought I'd have been lucky to just drop him. But he was – I mean, I had him up holding it. People went, wow. And, but then when I slammed his big butt, hit that ring, and it, that whole crowd just went, oh. Sound, I get goosebumps. And sound, I ain't never heard nothing like that. And I'd wrestled in that. I've never heard that sound before. Now, they may have heard it again, but I doubt it. But Abdul the Butcher, made, he was a man of his word. He made, he made Tommy Rich that night. You know, after I slammed him, it was – I was here, I was there. You know, it was over the top. And then it's just off to the races. So he would, you know, uh, a lot of people did different stories about Abby. But like I said, he told me that and I, it, at 18 or 19, I, you think it. I probably won't never even wrestle this guy again, you know. <laughs> but anyway, but he sure was. It was a man of his word. Uh, I'll ask you this then. Uh, we've got a couple more. We've got a few more minutes, so I'll ask you a couple of questions, then we'll go to the main event, yeah. and I will thank you for your time. Uh, one, so uh, this isn't the question, but you go through the last Battle of Atlanta with Buzz so uh, Sawyer. It's a two-year feud. Then you start tagging with Buzz for a short while, and you have the distinct pleasure of wrestling a very green pair of road warriors. What do you remember of uh, Hawk and Animal, the road warriors? They're beating the shit out of me. <laughs> you know, they were uh, only, only fell, only, you know, he was from Minnesota. They were bouncers. They were bouncers in a bar in Minnesota. And he didn't work out with them none because all he wanted to do was beat the hell out of people, you know, clothes lie, just bully stuff. Lord have mercy. But I'll tell you what, they they sure learned how to they learned how to work and become one of the one of the, you know top team tag teams, you know. But but when they first started, they'd say, You gotta wrestle the road with I'd say, Oh I'm like I feel good. He'd say, You still wrestling. So but but then but as, as they learned and they wanted to learn. They liked it bullying stuff. Uh and which only wanted him to be rugged anyway. He wanted him to knock the shit out of you. And uh, but they learned once they learned how to work, they was they was as good as anybody in the business. Did you ever wrestle them in the later eighties when you've got like a comparison of uh, you know early to late eighties Road Warriors and how much they improved? I'll give you a good story about my good friend Jim Crockett. He's doing a big show up there, and it's me and Jerry Lawler. Versus the Road Warriors. And Jim Crockett didn't like me because I told Mr. Barnett I won't work for him because he paid me $150. You hear me, Jim? Anyway, uh, it, I hope you're in Manchester near this. <laughs> so, anyway, Crockett told, told the Road Warriors uh, to make Jerry Lawler look like, you know, Hulk Hogan or somebody and to beat the shit out of me. The Road Warriors are my friend. They used to beat the shit out of me, <laughs> you know. And they, so we were like real good friends. They said, we ain't doing that. They, I don't remember what the finish was, but they beat the shit out of Waller. And they beat me up a little bit too, but Waller, he, he wasn't supposed to get beat on. He got his ass beat on, <laughs> too, you know. Uh, hey, James, we got 15 minutes, dude. So We're doing yeah. the two. No okay. worries. I'm yeah, uh, no worries. I'm on the case. Yeah, so 15 minutes. Well, 
if, if I have to carry the phone with me over the building, we'll just, I can. I, I can wrestle these guys and talk. <laughs> Don't worry, 15 minutes is all I need. 15 minutes is all I need. I'll give you a couple more then. Uh, in the later uh, 1980s, I'm thinking you have a good story or two about Jim Hurd. The best one in the world. You know, I told you I like to drink. Best, best one in the world. And, and back in the day, I like to wake up drinking a beer and drink till I went to bed. You know, on the way to the matches, back to the matches, at the bar, you know. But I always did my job, never never missed a show. So, And that's all Mr. Barnett cared about, you know. He didn't care about your personal bit. As long as you come done your job, which that's the way it should be, you know. Uh, he didn't care, but these other ones, they, they, and, and not necessarily all of them, but they all like to fool with me because I just look kid, and uh, you know they get mad because Mr. Barnett didn't care if I drank a beer, you know. But I never had one guy complain that I messed a finish up or that I throwed up or something stupid or I forgot to finish. Never done that. They told me to go 30 minutes or an hour. I did that. So it wasn't really nothing. It was just them. Like Ric Flair, he he didn't like it. He said, you know, said I alcoholic, but yet after the show, he could go, he could go and to the bar and get toe up, take his pants off and shake his stick around and stuff. And that was cool. You know, it just Double standards, and I wasn't one for them. You know, that's a that's a reason I uh, I was just very blessed, and I didn't have to. I didn't, you know, I was lucky. I worked for Barnett, and I'd go home to Tennessee, and I didn't have to. They didn't like me. They liked to use me because I draw the money. Plus, they didn't have to give me no money. They liked that. But as far as me as a person, or they didn't think I need to be in the business. Well, some of them I didn't think need to be a promoter either. So hmm. we even on that deal too. With Jim Hurd, did he ever try and give you oh, some? Oh, Jim Hurd, let me some, tell you this yes, story. Yes, please, yeah. Let me tell you this story real quick. So the last time I come back, it was WCW. Like I left and went to Tennessee. So Eddie Gilbert started booking. Well, he got me on back down there. But the deal was that I couldn't drink. I was an alcoholic. And I said, I said, oh, okay, okay. And uh, so anyway, Jim Hurd comes up to me. We had, we had to go to the office. They had I'm sitting at the table with Flair and I don't know, all their little committee. I, I'm having to listen to them tell me what I need to do and not to do. And uh, so anyway, Mr. Hurd, after it was all over, Mr. Hurd said, Tommy, come here a minute. And I didn't know him. I didn't know he was a pizza man or whatever. I didn't know what he did. And uh, he said, Tommy, I hear, I don't know if you do or, or not, but I hear people say you have a drinking problem. I said, well, I said, I don't think I got a drinking problem. I don't get in no trouble. I said, uh, blah, blah, blah. He said, he said, well, let me give you this example. He said, whether you are or whether you ain't drinking, he said, say there's this little tavern over here and you and your buddy standing out in front of it, you know, just standing there talking. Ain't been in, ain't had a beer, ain't done nothing. So somebody's going to ride by that says, there's Tommy Ridge drunker than hell over there, you know. And, and that, that was a good example, but at the same time, I thought, well, I still do my job, you know. And I, and I don't give a shit what people say about me, you know. As long as I can do what I want to do and be happy, and, and uh, they, nobody loves these wrestling fans no more than I do after 45 years, you know. I love, I still love coming to sign my autographs. I love coming and hearing the stories from some of these like here in West Virginia, we used to run up here quite a bit. And I had quite a few folks that were old that come up and said, we really appreciate you, Tommy, you know, blah, blah, blah. And that makes you feel good, you know. And it, and it makes you feel good that you made them feel good. 
suck. I will. Uh, I'm now going to give you because I think we've got ten minutes left in the podcast. I'm going to give a uh, give you the uh, main event, as it were. I call it the firing line. It's basically I'm going to give you some names of wrestlers that you've worked with or, or worked alongside or shared locker rooms with over the years. You tell me what you think. For the most part, you're probably going to say they're all great guys and everything. But if there's any, it's a funny story to bring in. Please do. But oh, we've also so funny. But, yeah, be. but uh, we've also only got ten minutes, so it might have to be a quick funny anecdote. But uh, for now, first one is Thunderbolt Patterson. Oh, oh, I'm full. I'm full of the hell. I'm full of hell, baby. When he gets full, that if he's full here, you're okay. But when he gets this full, you got trouble. <laughs> I love Thunderbolt to death. I love Thunderbolt to death. Uh, but he, Thunderbolt was, uh, he was hard to get along with sometimes. I mean, I got along. He he didn't get along with the office very well, you know. He didn't get along with the office. Part. I got along with him, uh, you know. He but he's an acquired taste. I mean, I I didn't. I mean, we didn't hang out together. I made one or two trips with him. As a matter of fact, funny story here when uh, Crockett bought Georgia Championship Wrestling. Crockett bought it. And he called all the boys that was at TV. He come in, they introduced him as a new owner, blah, blah, blah. And I didn't even think nothing about me being fired. But I got a lot. But my buddies, though, you know, the younger guys, because I was young, he said, well, I'm going to tell you all right now. And not really with no remorse, you know, just a smart idiot. He said, some of y'all will be hired, and then the rest of you is going to be fired. So then, so so that then then he said we've got a TV show tomorrow in Charlotte. Well, everybody was flying, but me and Thunderbolt. He had so he didn't like Thunderbolt either. <laughs> he, he, so he told me and Thunderbolt we had to drive. <laughs> he still ain't seen me. Yeah, fuck. Excuse me, but heck you with swear you. All you, like. you know. <laughs> Yeah, you ain't gonna treat me. It's cause you don't like me. And I don't need the job that bad. Mm. You know, I mean, he just—they were just uh, the promote. I mean, like I said, Mister Barnett, uh, Mister Geigel, you know them. Them were good men, uh, but like some of them, I just didn't. You know, they—they they wasn't. You know, they didn't. They didn't. It, and it wasn't necessarily I didn't like them. I just knew they didn't like me. And uh, so we didn't conversate much. So if one don't like you, I mean, it's not that you don't like them, but you don't care for them either. If they don't care, I'm not going to care if somebody don't care for me. You no, know exactly. Um, I've, I, I, I'll, uh, I've got about 15 names here, so this might have to be the uh, – because uh, for people who are not oh, okay. seeing. Hey, uh, I'm a minute or two, ladies. Fine. Yeah, okay. Then, uh, next one, Paul Orndorff. Paul, I love Paul to death. Uh, Paul, he was good people. Uh you know, and, and what a tough, what a tough guy he was too. You know, I mean, I heard stories. Uh, well, I seen him and Tony get into it between the tractor and trailer one night. <laughs> they stopped. One thing led to another. You know, and I hate seeing that. I hate, hate seeing that stuff. But they got out one tough or another. So then, anyway, ended up Tony got Paul in a bear hug. Tony. Paul bit his ear. Tony had to go to the hospital and get tetanus and just dumb, you know, just dumb. But I, like I said, I never had no problems like that. I'm a happy go lucky. <laughs> yeah, Orndorff was, uh, you said he was a tough guy and everything, but uh, I mean, he was also a huge draw in Georgia, wasn't he? Was he not even there that long? Oh, yeah, he drove good Georgia. And, uh, I think Florida he drew real good. Yeah, because that's where I think they, if I'm not mistaken, I think that's where he started. There, or Louisiana won. I'll move on then. Uh, Lance Russell. You talking about banana nose? Yeah, I am talking about him. Yeah, no, Lance. I tell you what. The, to me, the two best promoters, uh, Gordon Soldier was the greatest. I love. I love Greg Gordon Sully and Lance, of course, Lance. See, they were two different styles. Lance was old country guy like that, where Gordon was, well, he just got off his gluteus maximus. And he'd <laughs> say words and 
hell, I wouldn't even know what they meant. They probably didn't mean nothing. But he'd make it sound like, you know, hey, where, where's he coming up with this? Where Lance, he was just, you know, he was up and said, hey, get somebody, you know, do that. Gordon never got – hey, Gordon was just dead-ass serious. And Gordon, I tell you what, I love Gordon solely because uh, him and Bill After both. You know Bill After? Yep, yep, PWI. Magazine yeah. guy. I bet I'm on more front pages than any wrestler in, 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 that they ever had on there. Because he used to put me up. Of course, I was hot off at TV. But uh, Bill just really, I like, Bill was always nice to me. And, of course, anytime he asked me anything, I always did it. But he always took care of me, too. And Gordon, I mean, that's like Gordon. The announcer, he's the strongest man on the show because he can make you or he can break you. So if he don't like you and he needs to be saying good things about you, he might not. Uh, Jackie Fargo and Don. Jackie Fargo, baby, the strong. Jackie, I love, hey, can you talk about drugs? Of course you can. Well, you okay, this is this is it a long time ago when I was like 20. That's when I was a fabulous, uh, you know, Steve and Stan come in, they were the fabulous ones. Anyway, they left and they brought me and Eddie Gilbert in and made us the fabulous ones. But we were like prefab. I mean, that was their thing, you know. They'd be better off bring us in as Eddie Gilbert and Tommy Rick. But the, but the cool thing was Jackie Fargo, and I loved him. He because when I was a kid, I used to go watch him, and he was like my favorite. And uh, but anyway, we they got a little scene. We go into the ring, and it's me, Eddie Gilbert, and Jackie Fargo. And Jackie looked, he said, and you know, we're going to the ring, of course, it's blacked out. He said, he said, hand me this little bottle. And I was like, there again, I just got the business. So, you know, I mean, I knew about a little, you know, I ain't with no say I'm a dummy. But he is, I ain't never seen one of them little brown bottles, is what it was. And he had a little spoon. I, what is, he said, hit that before you get out. Of course, little Mikey said, okay, you know. <laughs> so I hit that to Eddie Gilbert. He couldn't even spell that stuff. And I guess he felt like he better do one to Jackie Big Man. He hit one, we got out of that Eddie Gilbert like that. But anyway, yeah, Jackie was just, uh, you know, he and they used to play ribs. They told me some of the ribs. Him and Don Fargo used to pull on people. And today you'd get shot on. But back then, that's the way it was. You had fun with the business. I'll give you two more then, and I'll thank you for your time. Uh, Jim Cornette, my favorite. Jim Cornette, your favorite? My favorite, Jim. You might not want to hear my Jim Cornette. Oh, no. Well, either way, I can take it. You like to get cheated out of money? Not really, no. Not, not really, no. no. Hell no, you don't. <laughs> not really, no. Anyway, I work for Smoky Mountain, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, see, I like talking about boys. You give me a promoter's name, I'll tell you a story about them. See, anyway, that's when Smoky Mountain was going under. Well, me and my cousin Johnny was the tag team champions. So anyway, we'd got our check at Friday. Well, I drove home to Atlanta, went to the bank, and the damn check wasn't no good. And then he shut down. He shut the territory down. Well, two or three days later, he called me. He said, hey, Tommy, he said, I need to get that tag belt back from you. I said, well, hey, Jimmy, I need to get that damn Twelve hundred dollars you owe me too. He said, "Well, well, I ain't got it." I said, "Well, I tell you what." And some guy had already contacted me about that bill, so I told him, "I said, well, Jim Cornette owes me this." I said, "You give this to me." I said, "It's yours." But I told Cornette, I called him, I said, "I got to go buy this bill." I said, "You got this is your chance to tell me you're gonna pay me or pay me my money," and he never would commit. I sold that belt. I mean, what you know? What's I mean? It, it was his belt, but he owed me the money. You know? Did you uh, uh, did you sell it for more I'm than twelve sure hundred? I'm sure his check didn't bounce either. <laughs> you know, he's one of them uh, like shady characters, you might say. Did you sell the belt for more than twelve hundred? I sold it for exactly what he owed me. 
There you go, then. That's all I want. If it had been a $500 check, I'd have sold it for $500. Because it didn't matter. The point was, my check bounced. He owed me that money. He wanted his belt back. Well, give me my money. I mean, if it had been $10 and he'd give me my $10, I'd have gave his belt back. But he wasn't going to do it. He thought I was going to really give it back. I, for some reason, give it back to him. And, uh, you know, like I said, I mean, I ain't out to screw nobody. And I, you can't, ain't nobody really tell you I ever took nothing from them. But I try to get what's supposed to be mine, you know, just like any other man would. Absolutely. Uh, Moose, do we have time for one more or do we need to wrap it up? Yeah, uh, one more. One, one, one more quick one. One more quick one. Okay, then. A quick yeah. story about the Iron yeah, Sheik. Would be done. I'm sorry, go ahead. A quick story about the Iron Sheik, if you've got one. Sheiky baby. <laughs> baby. Hey, you know Buzz Sawyer? You yeah. Know, you remember Buzz, right? Yeah, yeah. We up, we up in uh, Ohio or somewhere up there, and Sheik and and uh, Sheik and Buzz was traveling together. So we stay at this hotel. We're all there that night. So anyway, Buzz and Sheik get a room together. Well, we go out and having us some drink, whatever. Anyway, next morning, Oli calls and said, "Where, where is Buzz and?" She can't nobody find him. Can't nobody. Find him. We said, well, they're in this hotel somewhere. Anyway, they had got in there. And this is how they played. Like Buzz, you know, Sheik was a pretty tough fella. And I'm sure in his day would have whooped about anybody he wanted to. We got a couple more minutes because Moose is filming. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, long story short is we went over and knocked on uh, the door because we knew where they was at. They come staggering to the door. They opened that damn door, and they wasn't a, one thing in that room, in that room that was where it was supposed to be. <laughs> they got to saying, Buzz and Teddy, Buzz and tell Sheik he could whoop his ass. And then she said, You can't whoop my ass. I'm Sheiky, baby. And they would get to fighting. They would wrestle around, they wrestled around the room all night. And neither one of them said they won. It was like a draw. You know, I don't know, but they tore. I ain't no telling what it cost to pay for that room. But <laughs> they had tore it all to pieces. I was gonna, that's, I was, like, that's kind of fun when you say. One more about the Sheik and Buzz. We're in Michigan, and they pick this little gal up. But they don't know she's a young She asked, could she ride back? Was going to Toledo from Saginaw. Anyway, she got in the car and ride with And Buzz used to wear the little... Daisy Duke short, short as could be, flip flops. I don't care what what the degrees was. That's what he had on. Well, they're coming back. I, it's Ivan Koloff, Buzz, and somebody else. I can't think who. Anyway, all of a sudden, there's a helicopter over, hovering. Tells them, pull the car over, pull the car. Over. <laughs> they pull off. What it is, the little girl's sister had called. Called her parents, her parents called the police and said they had kidnapped their daughter. So anyway, here come the cops. They make them all, they make them all get out, buzzing and sure. They got to lay in the in the road on their belly and all that snow and all that snow. And finally, the little girl said she went on her own. And they ended up, but they had to lay in there, lay down there for about 30, 45 minutes before they even let them get up. Yeah. <laughs> How short boys were the shorts? Boys don't know how to have fun. But the boys don't know how to have fun like that no more. <laughs> how short were the shorts? That's the last question. Oh, I'm talking about booty shorts. <laughs> yeah. Not nothing to keep. He might as well have been naked as far as keeping them warm. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. The Iron Sheik and Buzz in hot pants in the snow. How can you how can you finish a, a show better than that? I, I realise, Tommy, you've got to go. I'll thank you so much for uh, uh, watching us for the last two hours. And thank you so much, Tommy. I hope to have you on again. Hey. James, I thank you, WSI, number one, number one, number one. Love you, man. Thank you. I hope I get to talk to you again soon. And uh, are you? Thank you very much, and thank you. Hey, and maybe next time, I'm, I'm 65, if you can ha have it hooked up, could you have uh, 235, no, not 35, 230-year-old, pretty gals with you standing on each side because that equal my age. You, you know, I'd feel bad to do a third, but if I had 
one that equal my age, it'd be okay. The other night, it took five of them to equal my age. <laughs> yeah, pretty girls where I live are a rarity. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll do uh, my best. Thank you so much, and thank you. <laughs>